<clears throat> so thank you for the introduction. My name is Brandon Blau. Um, I am a systems engineer, like you said, at um, Virgin Hyperloop, and we'll be talking a little bit about um, the Virgin Hyperloop high-speed transportation case study, um, how we utilize Capella right now. We've been utilizing Capella for about a year now, so we've kind of tuned in specific to um, our particular usages, um, what's working for us right now. And then I'll give a little bit of information about kind of where we as a company are um, moving towards with Capella um, in the future. So let's see, there we go. Um, oh yeah, so that's exactly what I just said there. A little bit of context, Capella now and then Capella forward. Um, <clears throat> so into the context, really what is Hyperloop? What is this system? So speed, the first thing people usually think of when they've heard of Hyperloop is that it's fast. Hi. Um, people usually like think upwards of <clears throat> 1,000 kilometers per hour. <clears throat> Apologies. Um, there are a few reasons that we're able to do this. First, um, you can see that from this slide here, you can see a little picture there lightly, hopefully. Oh yeah, it's just really dark there. Um, that the pod where we actually intend to carry people or cargo is inside of a tube, um, is what we colloquially call it. Um, sometimes we'll also call it a linear vacuum structure. Um, in that tube, we put it there so we can remove most of the air and reduce the aerodynamic drag that's on the vehicle. So we've got less friction, um, which allows us to use less energy to go faster. Um, reducing, uh, obviously reducing that air wind resistance um, lowers the waste energy as well, obviously. Um, and the fact that our vehicle, our pod here uh, is on, is levitated with magnetic levitation. Um, the fact that there's really no contact, no physical contact between um, the pod and anything else as it's traveling helps to super reduce um, our vehicle maintenance costs as well. So system operation wise, we operate very differently from many existing modes of transportation, especially rail, which is the mode that we share, I would say the most in common with, it's our most analogous form of, of transportation. <clears throat> Um, different though, our system is entirely autonomously controlled, um, which allows for very efficient operations and vehicle spacing. Think pods leaving every station every minute. Um, and if you're thinking about traditional rail or high speed rail, you have to stop at every single station um, along your route if you're trying to get from point A to point B. With Hyperloop and our system operations, we are direct to destination. So it would be more similar to um, like a taxi or an Uber, so point to point. <clears throat> Next, um, our system is a mass transportation system. And so safety and passenger comfort are paramount to the design of our system. Um, our system itself, as we've designed it, is inherently safe. We've got no interactions from weather or other modes of transportation inside of our enclosed tubes. Um, the, the system's on top of our vehicle, on top of our pod or inside of our pod are um, highly redundant in and of themselves. And as everything is autonomously controlled, not only from the pods, but um, from a central command center, which I'll go over a little bit later, there's no operator to introduce human error. And then finally, something that is very important to me is um, the sustainability aspect of our system. Um, and I think it needs, <clears throat> In the world that we're in right now, I think we've got a lot, uh, a lot of changes that we need to make in the sustainability aspect. And Hyperloop, uh, our system provides a unique solution to that. Our system is 100% electric, from the pods operating to the pumps pumping down the tubes to um, the portals and the stations. <clears throat> um, and none of that, obviously, being 100% electric, inherently produces any. Um, direct emissions. The elevated guideway um, itself, so the, the portal, if it's above grade, has a small footprint compared to other modes of transportation. Think um, big, long freeways. I'm here in LA where like, we've got big freeways that are eight, 10 lanes across each way. Um, so the footprint compared to that is much smaller on the environment. Um, and we're working on other ways as well um, to, to figure out ways that we can be more sustainable with our system. So that's a little bit of context about the Hyperloop system um, <clears throat> and some just key key facts about it. So 
moving forward, click, there we go. <clears throat> so now that you've got an understanding of the system, let's talk a little bit about where we are with our engineering progress and exactly how that fits in with our usage of Capella as we've done so far. <clears throat> so what we're talking about is delivering results in years, not decades. So we're trying to develop this technology fast. Um, but there is obviously challenges with that. Chief among them that we want our system to be 100% um, safety, uh, safe, and provide the efficiency necessary um, by the system. Um, so you can see we've uh, we've built a full-size test track out in Las Vegas, north of Las Vegas. It's about it's 500 meters long. Uh, as it stands right now, it is the world's third largest vacuum structure. That's a fun fact I didn't know um, before putting all this together for you guys. Um, but with that only being 500 meters, we've been able to reach 240 miles per hour or 387 kilometers per hour. Um, we've been continuing to do lots of test runs, um, but it is the world's first um, full-size uh, Hyperloop and we've learned a lot from it. We're continuing to do tests um, and kind of based on that is where we're moving forward with Capella as well. Um, this looks like it's the same slide. Apologies there. <clears throat> so looking beyond our, our site there at DevLoop in North Las Vegas, we're working towards our US certification. Being a <clears throat> transportation technology, as with trains, as with planes, as with cars, we need regulatory certification. We have figured out our regulator now um, in the US, and so we're working towards US certification. So that's our next big milestone. Um, so we just announced a Hyperloop Certification Center, HCC, last year or last week, which is going to be in West Virginia. And the goal is to have something compared to the 500 meters of track length about six miles long. So that's going to allow us to get up to our top speed. Um, as well as demonstrate more of our advanced maneuvers that are um, planned with our system operation. Convoying, so grouping pods together, high speed switches, turnoffs onto main alignment um, like you have on freeways. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so all, all, towards the, uh, all towards the goal of US certification, we are on the engineering side, integrating our systems into systems of systems. And I call it that, you could call them subsystems into systems, but I don't think that that necessarily captures the complexity of our subsystems. And so really integrating our systems into systems of systems, optimizing that data flow and making sure that we've locked down our, our safety um, in terms of like control architectures as well as performance is key um, in our next steps here. Cool. <clears throat> so at a high level, the system that we're talking about here um, comprises, I, I kind of broke them up into really four, four pieces here. So we've got our central command and control. So central to ensuring that our system is safe and efficient, as well as contrary to potentially other forms of transportation, think like, um, think like roads, cars, um, a central command and control controls infrastructure and the portals. Portals um, we call like our stations, like train stations, um, to optimize the flow of traffic and optimize the operations therein. So we've got this central node, which is kind of helping coordinate things at a high level um, to make sure that things are operating safely, um, as well as operating the most efficiently that they can. Looking Next, we've got our infrastructure and our portals themselves. So <clears throat> our infrastructure, as I've said before, is a network of tubes or linear vacuum structures which connect destinations. Um, so those are really where you would want to go. Um, it's similar to like the train tracks or highways and roads. Um, we have the pumps uh, along with those tubes, which reduce the air resistance. So they pump down the air, as well as the communication systems between the whole network to provide fast updated trip information to the passenger pods or the cargo pods, um, as well as entertainment where appropriate for the, <laughs> for the passengers. Yes, um, Portals is a fun geeky name. We actually have a dog at the office named Portal. Great dog. Um, so 
central and important to our system as well is the passenger. So our passengers and their experience are really what, what drives us in our design. We're trying to optimize their transportation in terms of their experience, um, as well as the speed. And then finally, um, the passenger pods. Well, this is pods, but like I'll talk more about the passenger pods. But small pods, um, small being up to 28, we um, can handle multiple different configurations, which could um, provide potentially different classes of transportation, similar to um, how you how there is in air travel. Um, <clears throat> And kind of relying on the infrastructure for um, the infrastructure options for storage, as well as that central command and control option, our pods are able to dynamically adjust our fleet sizes um, in relation to our um, demand. So if we've got a lot of people that want to go a lot of um, this separate destinations, our pods will introduce more or less vehicles um, into the system to handle that efficiently. <clears throat> okay, yeah. And so what I want to talk about as well, and I put a little Capella logo over there, um, I want to mention here that our usage of Capella, we've been using Capella for about a year now. <clears throat> and with that, we've kind of honed in what, how, we're, how we're using it. Um, with a little bit of trial and error, as I'm sure others have um, tried out just with any sort of tool that's, that's inherent. Um, but really with our pilot usage of Capella and MBSC, we are focusing on the pod. Um, and so that's really where we spend a majority of our effort with Capella and MBSC is looking at the design of the pod itself. So with the passenger pod, <clears throat> Why I call it like a system of systems and why it can be called a system of systems is because there's so much in this passenger pod. It's really like an autonomous car mixed with an airplane at the same time. <clears throat> so obviously for the passenger vehicles, um, you've got a passenger compartment or a cargo, compar cargo compartment. Um, <clears throat> you need uh, environmental control, ECLIS, um, and life support systems so you can handle life support in there as well as obviously the pods have to be vacuum compatible. So that those two alone apply a whole lot of requirements if you could think about it um, on the structure of the pods. Um, and if we're operating in a near vacuum, you can also think of the amount of pressures and forces that are gonna be exerted on the pod um, as well. Now, <clears throat> inside of the passenger or cargo compartment, we also have that passenger entertainment or just uh, information system uh, which is providing the passengers not only with like entertainment similar to like an airplane um, or connection to the outside world via like wi-fi and internet connections um, but updated route and trip information as well our command and control systems is like a big um, a big part of our passenger pod um, because our passenger pods are autonomous themselves so our passenger pods in the cnc systems um, you can think of in terms of their scope and complexity, similar to how a um, autonomous car operates. So the CNC systems include um, the autonomous operations to handle nominal and off nominal events, right? We've got the onboard systems monitoring, um, as well as the handling of route handling and the direct to destination controls. <clears throat> um, separate from the CNC, we've got our whole subsystem or system sensing. Um, again, similar to the sensing uh, suite that you would have on a autonomous car, we've got our line of sight sensor packages among other sensor packages, um, which just helps to have an understanding, at, just helps the, the CNC systems have an understanding of what's going on in the tube around the pod. And then finally, obviously we've got our communication systems, so our, our sets of um, antennas and radios to enable pod-to-pod -pod communication to allow the, the convoying. So uh, having multiple pods travel in a close group together, um, as well as like far field communication. So that's, that's more talking back from the passenger pod um, or the cargo pod back to the, the central command. Um, 
for route information and guidance or passenger entertainment information. Um, that could be potentially expanded, um, but those are the two key things that we're looking at with um, our goals and our design of that. So, as I told you, our use of Capella currently is a little bit of a pilot and we've tuned it in um, in terms of our usage of the raw Capella tool itself. We are we have a roadmap moving forward for kind of how we're going to build on that and move from a more model augmented engineering process, which is where we currently are, um, into a model centric um, or roughly or even like maybe slightly less model centric, but model centric approach is kind of the goal. Um, fun little fact, we use Capella version 1.40. <laughs> I just thought I'd toss that in there. Um, I know that everyone's on 141 now, but the key thing here um, that is a benefit to us using 140 is the differentiation between human and non-human actors, specifically when we're talking about um, modeling use cases for testing different components or modeling use cases for um, passenger interactions with our systems, being able to decompose between um, a human actor and a non-human actor in those sorts of contexts, or if we're trying to like do system to subsystem transitions is a huge benefit of 140. Now there are five, <clears throat> there are five different um, analysis perspectives with Arcadia that Capella support. Primarily, our usage, our pilot usage here focuses mostly on the logical architecture and physical architecture perspectives. Um, that's based on the maturity of our technology. Um, we've got our proven technology and we're just trying to hone in exactly our um, implementation and make sure that everything's solid. Um, and so based on that, we are we focus a lot of our effort to get the most benefit from our effort in logical architecture and physical architecture perspectives. Um, the custom design properties and diagram styling, um, I have found to be, I don't wanna call like um, absolutely essential, but near absolutely essential. So we have a, a growing team of modelers um, that are all working in, in, the, in the tool at the same time and potentially producing their own outputs. Um, the ability, so we, specifically with our physical architecture layer, we use the custom properties and diagram styling to apply specific property values um, to components so that we um, produce consistent diagrams out of our model. Um, let's see, did you only look at operational aspects of the pod or did you consider other contexts such as manufacturing and maintenance? That's a really good question. Um, so yes, that we do look at those. Um, we do look at those aspects as well, and it's been baked into um, exactly how we've gone about the specific design of our pods and specific subsystems within our pods, and how we build out um, specifically with like manufacturing and maintenance. Really, um, something that we've been keen to look at that doesn't necessarily fit into how. Um, it doesn't really get represented well in Capella, but um, within our systems engineering organization, we make sure that we look at things like manufacturing and maintenance to make sure that there is like like physical space to go in and um, install or repair things. That's a huge a huge um, issue that I've personally come across previously in different um, situations, and it is something that we do look at, but it isn't necessarily um, Capella and the way that it kind of abstracts away from physical designs, um, specific to that point that I was uh, speaking of, we don't really look at that within Capella here, but we do model um, like maintenance operations, um, you know, updating software, changing out components. Um, those are some of the big ones in, in terms of maintenance, um, but we do model those sorts of things in terms of use cases within Capella. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about the use cases as well um, a little bit later. Great question, Julian. So <clears throat> in our current state right now, we haven't involved the design engineers in the modeling directly yet. Kind of how we have it working right now as, as we've been um, ramping up in terms of model-based engineering 
working towards model-centric engineering is that right now we've got our systems engineers working, um, being the primary ones working in Capella right now. And then we go back and forth with the design teams to ensure accuracy um, via either like direct like snips out of the model or um, via kind of the HTML exports. Um, and we've built our own internal um, landing pages to help navigate and streamline their access to um, the HTML exports as well. So we are, uh, as part of shifting towards a model-based um, uh, and a model-centric engineering organization, we still have a um, reliance on text-based requirements um, within our organization. And so uh, a big thing that we use currently right now is the requirements add-on via doors ng, which is a little clunky. Um, so via the rec if, there's a better solution that we will be shifting to that I'll talk to in the future to help streamline the use of, um, <laughs> to help streamline the use of text-based requirements. Um, yeah, so essentially we use the requirements to help augment either our model functions to provide performance um, characteristics um, of our particular functions that, that maybe can't be elicited based on just the, the sequences. Um, but it, essentially we use the requirements to reduce any ambiguity with um, our, our usage currently. Um, and then finally, the last thing that I will talk about is that currently how we have it right now is we've got a single passenger pod model, which includes the logical and physical architecture layers. Um, and then we utilize Teams from Capella right now to enable multiple people to work on that at once. Um, as we talk about, as I talk about our evolving usage and kind of our more advanced configuration that we're going to be shifting to in the next couple of months, um, that's going to change slightly. Still going to utilize Teams for Capella, but um, going to turn it into more of a, a I, I like to call it a federated model, but breaking down the, the system model into lots of different subsystem models. So talking at, um, talking about the logical architecture perspective. Now, I wanted to put in here um, direct exports from uh, the model that we have right now, but unfortunately I can't do that. So I wanna talk about exactly how we leverage these different perspectives, the logical architecture and physical architecture perspectives, how we've honed into our specific um, leveraging of those two to get the most benefit out of them for our particular usages. Our particular usages being a um, fast-paced system, high um, fast-paced development system, high safety requirements um, that's already like roughly pretty mature. So looking in, <clears throat> we kind of follow a, a, a one, two, three repeat sort of um, process uh, that begins with functional decomposition. So there's a lot of different tools within Capella that you can do functional decomposition and you can do it any different number of places. Um, we've chosen these particular places because not only are they effective in actually um, decomposing the functions, but they're effective in us reviewing as an internal systems engineering team, as well as communicating with our design teams and external, um, external stakeholders um, to ensure accuracy. And so these two are the ones that we look at the most. So logical data flow. So I put a little picture, a little image of a, a data flow diagram up there just to help elicit the point. Um, we first look at the systems of our, like uh, the function of our system or subsystem that we're looking at right now and decompose that regardless of um, which component we might imagine doing it. Just think about like getting down the function as near like as to as small fine re detail as you can. Um, and building out that information network. I call it an information network, but um, the network of functional exchanges between the functions themselves. Um, so the logical data flow diagram really helps us do that um, functional decomposition of our pasture pod in this instance, um, when we're talking about um, like breaking down like the ECLIS system into the raw functions that we need our ECLIS system to do. We're talking about um, what we need the door to do or how we need um, particular functionalities of the CNC system to operate within each other to ensure that we've got an overall control architecture 
that um, is safe and efficient. So um, logical data flow is our, our main tool with that. Um, I've found as well, sometimes it's, it's helpful for me to look at a functional breakdown. Those diagrams update automatically, which is really nice. Um, but looking at that organized traceability of how I've broken down functions in a tree sort of view has helped me find places where um, maybe just looking at it from a, a graphical perspective, I see that I've decomposed really far on one side. Um, and so maybe that's missing on the other side. Not always a truth, but it's, it's, a, it's a place to um, ask the question. So after we've decomposed the functions to our final, to our lowest level that we think possible or um, uh, efficient or like uh, practical, practical. <laughs> After we decompose our functions to the lowest level practical, we look about our logical component decomposition. So looking at our passenger pod, what are the components inside of it? Um, making sure that the definitions make sense and adjusting the definitions where possible um, and essentially allocating, taking those fully decomposed functions that we've got, those lowest level, like um, I call them like atomic functions or like belief functions, so like, most absolute things that the system needs to do and saying, okay, like how can I group these together potentially in the most efficient way in terms of functional executions, maybe next to each other, um, maybe not, or like kind of trying to minimize information flow between different components um, or not. Essentially just refining the logical definition or the definition of the functional definition of the different components within whatever we're looking at. Um, and the logical architecture helps do that because it provides, um, again, uh, a, a complete view of exactly what your component is doing. If you are just looking at one logical data flow diagram, for instance, it could be tough. You could you could have decomposed like acquire images and control the camera correctly, <clears throat> but you might find gaps in functions that you're missing either at the decomposed layer or higher up. When you look at um, the suite of functions that you've assigned to your camera as a whole and thinking about the functions that a camera needs to do. <clears throat> the final piece is kind of what people have been asking about and is the, the more fun piece, in my opinion, um, is more the behavioral analysis. So we really like to use functional chains and then transitioning those past functional scenarios to exchange scenarios. Um, Functional chains at a high level, um, they allow us to just look at a more kind of abstract or macro level um, flow of information, a uh, flow of how we want to, um, flow of how like our system is supposed to respond um, to particular situations. Um, and especially working at it from an LAB or a, a logical architecture diagram like this, seeing the full suite of functions and paths optional um, when you're at one function's execution, um, makes that like super easy to check and find also holes there. Um, so after we've gotten uh, a functional chain, which we think is accurate, then we transition those all the way over to exchange scenarios where we can then apply um, the most accurate and detailed rigor to defining um, the details of the sequencing, potentially mode changes, um, and then timing that we need and is expected from the system um, with the benefit that we can see the functional allocations on the components to understand this component is doing this, this component is doing this, this component is doing this, next. So um, after we do that sort of behavioral analysis, so looking at the different exchange scenarios, um, functional chains in the context of use cases, in the context of off nominal situations, um, we go back and refine um, and come back down as appropriate. Physical architecture side, we use potentially a little bit different than people might um, anticipate. So we do the majority of our functional decomposition um, back here in the logical architecture layer until we're, um, essentially until we're like completely happy and the next level down would be sending it to like a software team for pure implementation. It would be like the software requirement spec, if you're familiar with that sort of a um, handoff, um, or it would go directly to um, potentially 
mechanical or structural engineers to start looking at exactly how they're going to implement um, some of the functionalities that we have necessary on physical components. So when we look at our physical architecture, um, we use it with multiple different physical um, physical configurations. So um, because of the pace that we're going at, we've got tons of different test assets which have different physical configurations, which we are testing different behaviors on, um, potentially at the same time, due to like how fast we're trying to go, as well as um, just the development of our different subsystems. So to help handle that, we look at our passenger pod as a whole level to do our functional decomposition. And then we've got different physical configurations, potentially overlapping in some behaviors. Um, and then allocate onto them. So we transition our logical components, functions, and exchanges down to our physical world um, and allocate those as behavioral components onto our physical nodes. So our physical configurations, we really focus on bringing out the detail as much as possible on the, the implementation of the physical nodes, so like the resources of our system. Um, and taking a combined look at not just the data flow, which is inherent um, and a little bit easy, the, the more natural thing with Capella, but also like the power distribution network. Um, and then we've got some select physical interfaces that we look at there as well. The thing that I always um, talk to as being kind of a, a different one is like thermal interfaces. So, as we build out our physical, as we finish building out our physical configuration, our physical nodes, we transition our logical components, functions, functions and exchanges that we've completely solidified through our iterative process um, at the highest level to, or at the, at the next, at the previous um, perspective, analysis perspective. And we transition those down, allocate them to our physical configurations. And then sort of in a similar fashion to how we did it in the logical analysis layer, we will analyze only a few select behavioral system responses. Um, so responses of our system here now in the physical world, uh, in our physical implementation, to find any sorts of nuances and reduce any risks that we may have um, highlighted uh, due to a specific physical configuration to understand how we expect our physical system um, and that potentially um, multiplicative elements of like controllers, for instance, um, to handle or like data networks, data flows, um, how we want that to be handled within our physical configuration um, from that perspective. So from our physical architecture, we don't do too much into the behavioral response analysis um, and instead focus mostly on detailing out that physical implementation making sure that our physical implementations um, and our physical products, they have a um, complete and accurate and clear um, definition of their functions, um, of their functional behaviors and their functional um, requirements. So that's everything that we've, that's how we've honed it in so far. Now the next exciting thing that I love to talk about and I'm so excited about is looking towards the future for how we're going to jump off of our particular usage with Capella right now and from, uh, from our more model augmented engineering practice towards model centric engineering. Now, Capella, as you can see in this, obviously as the model based systems engineering tool, but also due to its um, particular natures of open sourceness and um, just usability, um, Capella is central to uh, a model-centric engineering approach and the one that we are aiming towards. Is, um, it provides the ease of use as well as this, this system here, this um, over, overall model-centric engineering approach here specific that we will be implementing, um, provides the, uh, the required um, to develop the system of systems, these whole complex systems um, to the accuracy and rigor required for our system needs. I mean, 
the thing that I always think back to if I'm um, designing something and something doesn't quite look right is I'll raise my hand and I'll say, you know what, this is a passenger product. We're going to have passengers on it. Safety has got to be paramount to it. Um, and so in terms of my engineering practice, as well as the engineering practice that we will be implementing as well, this sort of process here and this sort of configuration here will enable us to provide that rigor and ensure that rigor um, appropriately. Um, there's efficiencies with model-centric engineering that I'm not going to go through. <laughs> I think everyone is well aware of them, but this will help us more take advantage of those efficiencies um, in terms of like reduced ICDs, which could be a nightmare, reduced document ICDs, which could be a nightmare, um, and then cross-tool integrations to um, enable quick analyses as well as um, accurate information on all different engineering teams here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the linchpin with all of this is actually systems modeling workbench. So as I mentioned before, right now we use doors for our requirements management tool. Um, but what I didn't mention is that on the um, CAD, or so like on the, on the physical design side, we use NX and Team Center currently in our engineering organization. The system modeling workbench tool um, essentially connects, um, makes that connection between Capella and Team Center to enable kind of a, a complete view of um, uh, a complete view of something, uh, particularly like a subsystem or like a component um, from both like a physical part perspective as well as then you can look at the MBSC model of it, which is really cool. Um, their requirements management tool just allows us um, quick and easy seamless transition between um, writing requirements and allocating them to model elements without the need for requirement uh, RecIF tools, um, the RecIF kind of transport back. Um, yeah, and then there's some APIs specific to Capella and SMW, which enable us as well to take advantage of a DBC, a DBC format being um, like CAN network messages um, to enable us to control the um, communication and like I, the detailed ICDs of messages, message structures within Capella, within our model-based systems engineering tool um, to then push out to um, our C code or like our, our embedded team to generate um, ICDs. So how you could think about it in that avenue is say we need to send a new message between two controllers, we update the MBSC, um, we update our model here. Oh, I can use this little widget for we update our model here, um, send some revisions in Team Center to ensure that um, as we've revved this model, it, all of the processes to get it approved are correct. We can export from our model now um, this, uh, this DVC file, which contains a brand new added message. And that can be pushed over with our own internal tools that we've got to auto-generate the code necessary to handle the inputs and the output messages uh, on the adjoining boards. We can write requirements against our, um, our new message that we added here, um, which can be included in a, a requirement specification if, if someone wanted to use a requirement specification to, to build something out um, here, or they could just reference NX being uh, like a CAD model system. Um, so this connection here would be like a, uh, a requirement specification. This connection here would be just looking at our model, maybe looking at the sequence messages, looking at our network design, what have you. Um, and as I said, with, with the system modeling workbench and Capella APIs, in addition to some of the team center APIs, um, we are actually able to connect to some of our own internal tools, um, which help us to do some um, specific analysis on our system operations to really fine tune everything that we're, we're working towards. Um, I've optionally put in here this kind of MATLAB and Simulink um, portion here. It is, it is a goal of mine to add in um, the analysis tool that we have here within these two um, tool suites, but that direct connection I'm not exactly sure on yet, so I just put it there as like a dotted line. Um, but 
Yeah, so this is, this is where we're going to. Um, our usage of Capella, we're gonna shift from like one whole passenger pod model into um, federated models um, in terms of using system to subsystem transitions iteratively um, to build out a whole like product breakdown structure of like, here's our passenger pod maybe. Um, here's a model for like the ECLIS system. Here's a model for the CNC system. Here's a model for the passenger compartment itself. Um, and breaking down those in Team Center as well as in um, Capella's model based systems engineering tool so that we can have, um, we can connect our, um, our model of the passenger pod and all the functions at the system level or at the, at the passenger pod system level um, that we need it to do to the specification potentially that we may have to write um, or the, the collection of text-based requirements which help define those functions of the passenger pod at the system level. We can connect that to the NX physical CAD model of our passenger pod to ensure that all of them are in sync um, and you can access all of them to just take a look and really understand um, exactly what uh, a defined system or subsystem um, is supposed to do. It's really exciting. I'm like, I geek out about that part because it's been like, uh, I've, I've needed a lot of help from the OBO team and Siemens team, um, as well as other resources to help kind of figure out exactly how we're gonna do this. And it's been a recent discovery to figure out exactly, tune this all in, um, but it is what we're marching towards. Um, and I think it, it's a valuable thing to communicate how you can build an ecosystem like this and specifically how we build our ecosystem um, to help show um, the, the power of Capella in the right ecosystems um, to achieve um, these complex safety critical um, designs of systems, systems of systems of Hyperloop. <laughs> um, so that's my long spiel. Are there any questions? Thanks, Brandon. Yes, we have, we have a lot of questions actually. Um, we well, we are owning off the time, but since nobody is waiting, is there a list <laughs> we can we can go for questions. So, first question: uh, Could you describe the challenge to shift people towards a model centric world? Mm -hmm. A hundred percent, and I can actually speak from that from my own personal perspective as well. So prior to coming to Hyperloop, I worked within um, space systems engineering, um, specifically at a company called Northrop Grumman, working on satellite communication systems. Um, and their satellite communication systems, which have been around for tens of years, 20s of years, potentially on some of them. And so those are really based on document-based systems engineering. Um, and obviously being the space applications, they have to have high amounts of rigor applied to them. Um, from my experience there, the, the, it's, it's, it's a little natural. It, it is natural in, for me as well to think about defining a system, like let's write down exactly what it does. Um, the challenge in that, that I've shared as well as potentially some of my other colleagues who also have experience in that shifting from the idea of we're gonna write down a full document of like what our system is going to do versus um, model it out and define all of the relationships that our system is going to do um, and, and work off of that. So while, we're, while there's not um, a huge struggle because we are a new company, we've got a lot of um, people that are just excited to solve the problem and um, we've got a belief within our engineering organization that MBSC has huge benefits um, and Capella is easy to use and readable for um, the people that really aren't doing the modeling itself, um, helps helps ease that transition as well. Okay, thanks. Um, how did you model safety aspects? That's a good question. So <clears throat> how we interact with the safety team, with our safety organization and team right now, um, is they really come in as part of um, this third step. Let me see if I can look like that. This third step in our um, detailed 
perspective or detailed um, functional decomposition. So they really come in and take a look at um, step step two and step three. So take a look at our, our system as we've got it defined here and the functions and the relationships which are built in it, um, as well as the behavior that we've defined and the flow of the behavior between the system um, as it's defined. And they analyze those portions to find weak points. Um, and then we do, we essentially do like directed behavior analysis, so directed um, use cases of functional chains and exchange scenarios to understand how we are, how we need to define our system to um, handle these sorts of situations, these sorts of like safety aspects or safety um, potentially issues. Um, and then define functions to make sure that we've completely alleviated those concerns. So it's really iterative. They're part of the process here while they're not physically in their modeling. Um, they're part of the team that, that kind of get um, um, the output here that helps kind of not be Capella, come back here, loop back in and help us update our model and update our design to ensure everything there is accurate and safety. Um, uh, Safety good. good. <laughs> safety kosher. I don't know. Safety um, approved. Yeah, safety approved. It sounds better. Okay. And probably the last questions. Uh, how do you ensure a consistent modeling, uh, considering you have many modelers? Mm -hmm. That is a big challenge right now. And it's something that I didn't necessarily talk to specifically with how we're working right now. Given that we work with one model, we've got multiple modelers and we use Teams for Capella, so everyone potentially could be working in it right now at the same time. Um, there is sort of that inherent, at least in our current configuration, and it is something that we're changing and has been paramount in um, the definition of how our new and like the, the configuration that we're building to is, is um, that some person could come in here, not only um, that modeling could be potentially inconsistent between team members. We can handle inconsistencies between team members through our internal reviews. Um, but uh, potentially uh, this person here could change something inadvertently or advertently um, that person that this person here updated. Um, and there's a little bit of a lack of source control right now on that. Um, our usage as we shift here towards um, not only dropping from like one particular model to uh, using system to subsystem to build out lots of small, smaller models which build on each other, um, but adding that into Team Center enables um, change control, lifecycle management to ensure that we finish this model, check here, it's all good. We've checked through every single thing and it's not going to change. Everyone can, can jump off of that. Right, and the very last one, uh, how do you plan to manage uh, requirement configuration control and version control? Okay, yeah, so requirement, um, so how we're gonna do it is within Team Center, we're creating, not to get into the full weeds of it, but within Team Center, um, we're creating specific Team Center objects um, which relate to one particular item potentially in a product breakdown structure. Um, that item, so if we're talking about like the passenger pod, for instance, we'll create an object for the passenger pod, which has um, slots in it for our MBSC model, our requirement specification, um, and then any like any CAD and then any sort of uh, supporting documentation. Team Center PLM um, and requirements management, um, as it links in with system modeling workbench, they're tied together which really in the future takes that whole concern out of question because it all fits into a sort of um, check out, revise, approve, send to workflow. Yeah. Okay, thanks. We, we had a lot of other questions, but fortunately not so much time to answer it. So I invite you all the attendee who have some questions to contact you. I'm sure we'll be yeah, absolutely. happy to answer. 100%. Yes. Um, Thanks again for this uh, for this presentation. It was really really interesting, and uh, I hope we have some news later when you will 
starts a new phase of your deployment. Yes, keep a word, keep an eye out. We've got a lot of fun things coming, so definitely take a look. And I really appreciate you organizing this and um, allowing us to share this here today.